Last week, I told you guys that a remnant, a remnant is a small remaining quantity of something. Okay, like at your house, if you have uh, a small room or maybe a big closet that you want to put flooring down in, you can go to the flooring store and say, hey, do you guys have any carpet remnants? The idea of a remnant is that it may be a small portion, but it can serve a big purpose. This weekend, what I want to tell you is this, and this is my whole sermon in one sentence. Okay, so write this down. Those who receive what is revealed will be rescued, redeemed, and restored. And the title for this sermon is this, My Personal Apocalypse. Write that down. I personally believe that the book of Daniel is a gift from God to us. Like to me, it declares to God's people the time of the end. But it also prepares God's people for the time of the end. Some of the greatest end times pictures and prophecies are found in the book of Daniel. It's considered an apocalyptic book because God gave Daniel very specific visions of what will happen in the last days. When the world as we know it ceases to exist, it will be unrecognizable. Now, my kids are like all about the apocalypse. They are. They love to talk about the apocalypse. They like to read about the apocalypse. They like to watch movies about the apocalypse. You know what I mean? And there's no shortage of movies about the apocalypse, are there? How many of you guys love apocalyptic movies? Yes, yeah, it's, it's like it's our favorite. When my kids were younger, they, they were really obsessed with the apocalypse. I don't know if that's my, my fault or what. But they were always talking about it. When we would go to school, I want to take them to school. We're on our way, and they'd be talking about whatever. But when I drop them off, I pray for them. Hey, you guys have a good day, a blessed day. Pray for them. God, help the teachers be patient with my kids. You know, that kind of stuff. But when they were getting out of the car, they would say, hey, Dad, now in case of the apocalypse, where do we meet up? <laughs> <laughs> they always wanted to know, what's the plan for the apocalypse? And they always had backpacks. I don't know if, if, how many of you remember my boys when they were younger, but they always had backpacks. And my middle son, Cannon, still has a huge backpack with him most of the time. And so at any given point, there is apocalyptic paraphernalia in that backpack. I mean, anything from energy bars to, you know, knives and strings with hooks on them in case they need to catch a fish, you know, <laughs> all kinds of stuff. One day I was taking them to school and uh, we were about to leave the house and Cannon was putting something in his backpack. And I said, whoa, 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 what, what is that? He goes, oh, nothing. I just put something in my backpack. What is it, son? And he goes, it's a hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what? what are you going to do with that? I don't think it's right to bring that to school. Anyway, most people believe there will be an apocalypse. You got the sci-fi people who think it's going to be aliens or zombies. You have the climate change people who are adamant that man hasn't taken good enough care of the world. Right? So it's going to come from that standpoint. And they're probably right. We haven't taken a good care of the world. I get that. But the real reason that the world as we know it will change is because man hasn't taken very good care of his heart. Just like in the days of Noah. It says, every imagination of the thoughts of man's heart was continually evil. In Second Peter chapter 3, Peter says, the heavens and the earth as we know it, the earth we see and know have been kept by his word until the time when they are to be destroyed by fire. The day men will stand before God and sinners will be destroyed. The whole book of Revelation is about this time, about this season of history. Did you know that the very first word in the book of Revelation is apocalypse? Revelation 1, verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bondservants the things which must take place soon. The revelation, the revelation. That's actually one word in the original language, and that's apocalypsis in Greek. Apocalypsis. That's where we get the word apocalypse. 
Now, most people think that God's going to destroy the world because he is vengeful. And he is angry. Okay? So the uneducated translation of Revelation 1, verse 1 would be, uh, the angry lashing out of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> like that's what the book of Revelation is about. The angry lashing out of Jesus. Apocalypsis means a revealing. That's what it means to uncover. Apocalypsis means this disclosure of truth. I want you all to listen to me. It has never been God's desire to destroy people. His only desire is that all men would know the truth because the truth will set us free to live the life that he's promised and provided for us to live in and through his son, Jesus Christ. First Timothy chapter two, right? John chapter eight. So apocalypse has become a word used to describe the destruction of all things. The book of Revelation is thought to uh, be all about how God pours out his wrath upon the earth which isn't entirely wrong because that is what's going to happen. But I think we end up missing the greater point. Joel chapter two, God's speaking through the prophet Joel. And he says, it shall be in the last days, in the last days, what days? The last days, the end times. It shall be in the last days, at the time of the end, the end times, God says that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, uh, all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall have dreams. Even on my bond servants, even on my slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. He says, I will grant wonders in the sky and signs on the earth below blood, fire, vapors of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be. That everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So the God, God told the prophet Joel that he would reveal himself in a powerful way in the time of the end, in the last days. And he would do it by his spirit, through his people, and that anyone who receives what is revealed will be rescued and redeemed and restored. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus and his disciples were talking about the end times. And they came up to him and they said, hey, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And Jesus replied, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed on uh, by his own authority. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. What Jesus wasn't saying is that you couldn't know or wouldn't know the times or seasons. We know that the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 says that we will know the season of the end because of all the prophecies and signs that we read in the scriptures. Okay, What Jesus means is don't focus your attention on the season. Like all the crazy stuff that's going on around you. Don't focus on the chaos. Don't hyper focus on all the weirdness going on around you. Focus on why you are alive in that season. And that's to be my witness. That's to share the truth. That is to bring good news. We can't, listen to me, we can't just be a witness of what's going on around us. We have to be a witness to Everyone around us. You know there's a big difference, right? Yes. It's okay to be frustrated by stuff going on around, uh, going on around us. It's okay to be frustrated by gender confusion and how your daughter's wrestling career is being robbed from her by young men who identify as a female. Yeah, it's okay to be frustrated about that. Totally absurd. Be frustrated. But when I'm a believer and I spend more time complaining and fighting for my daughter's right to a fair fight than I do praying for and sharing the gospel to the world around me, something's not quite right in me. 
I think a lot of us do want to be a witness to the world around us in these interesting times, but we just feel so small. We feel unimportant. We feel like we're insignificant. What do I have to say? What do I have to offer? I'm a nobody. Well, that's what's great about a remnant. It can be a small portion, but serve a big purpose. Last week, we talked about Noah. Well, Noah was a nobody. (laughs) He was insignificant, unimportant, except that he walked with God and he was blameless in his time. Same thing with Daniel in his time. He was a nobody. But it says that he was not eaten by those lions because God found him to be blameless. His first priority was always to please God. And look how God used him. Again, the book of Daniel is an apocalyptic book. But listen to me. Not only because of the detailed dreams and visions God gave Daniel about the end of the world. But listen, also because Daniel's world, as he knew it, had ended. Daniel chapter 1. Let's read. Daniel 1 says, during the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took those objects back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. Then The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring in some Israelites from the royal families and nobility. Young men, without blemish, handsome, gifted in all wisdom, knowledgeable, quick to understand. In other words, qualified to serve in the king's palace and to teach them the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Okay, so can you imagine going through this? Your city being attacked your loved ones hurt or killed or captured. You're ripped away from the only community, culture, the only way of life you've ever known and taken away to a civilization that may have even seemed futuristic. There was nobody like Babylon. Babylon was more advanced than anyone. In every way, more advanced in architecture, mathematics. I mean, everything. The city itself would have been overwhelming, huge, and amazing. But at the very same time, terrifying and offensive. There would have been pagan temples everywhere. Idolatrous images all over the place. This would have been like a physical, mental, emotional spiritual culture shock. When Melissa and I had been married a couple of years, we moved from Tyler to the DFW. She was going to be finishing up her um, college degree at the University of Arlington. So we moved up there from Tyler to Dallas. That's culture shock. You guys know what I'm talking about? Tyler's, especially back then, had this nice little pace of life. You move up to Dallas and you're like, boom, boom, everything's just all over you, all around you. And I ended up getting a job where I had to service all of DFW. Okay. So one hour I'd have to be in Dallas. The next hour I'd have to be in downtown Fort Worth fixing something. And you know, that's a big place. It takes, it takes a long time to get from Dallas to Fort Worth, right? I didn't know where I was going. So they would give you this big old thick thing called a Mapsco. Anyone remember Mapscos? Mapscos were this, this book, it was th- that thick, and each page represented a portion of the city. And so you kind of drive and you're at the end of the page. Whoa, I got to turn the page. That's where I'm at now. And it's really, really confusing, to be honest. I'd never seen anything like that. For me, I, growing up, it's like, it's simple. Take a ride at the dead turtle. That's when you know you're going to be at wherever you're at. You know what I'm saying? I was miserable. I'm driving down the road, 
my work van's always swerving because I'm always looking and I'm always bawling, just crying. God, I just want to go home. Where's the turtle? <laughs> my move to Dallas was nothing compared to Daniel's capture. What happened to him and his family and his friends probably felt apocalyptic. And yet what would have weakened the resolve of most young men seemed to strengthen the resolve of Daniel. This trial didn't kill him. It didn't kill his faith. If anything, it confirmed his faith. And you want to know why? Because Daniel is someone who lived his life in partnership with God. That's what we talked about last week. Please go back and listen. I, I hope that you will track with every sermon in this series. You will be glad that you did. Daniel was a teenager that prayed to God a lot. 15, 16, maybe 17 year old young man who read the scriptures and who listened to the prophets. God had just sent Jeremiah to tell the people. Jeremiah chapter 25. For 23 years I have sent my prophets telling you to turn from your idols and that if you will, I will continue to bless you. But if you do not, I'll have to humble you. By the way, by the way does that sound like a, a God that wants to destroy people? No, not at all. It does sound like a God who's eager to reveal himself to disclose the truth to his people and give them an opportunity to receive that truth. He goes on and he says, because you have continually ignored me, I will now send Babylon, uh, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar and he will cause you harm and take you captive and you will be miserable and your land will be desolate, empty, unproductive, empty, apocalyptic looking, for 70 years. So now Daniel's here in Babylon and, and it's just craziness. And he's looking around and he's like, uh, guys, I think all of this is that. Remembering the words of Jeremiah. Did you notice in Daniel 1 that it says the Lord gave Nebuchadnezzar victory? And the Lord permitted him to take those sacred objects. Listen to me. This 70-year captivity was designed by God to bring revelation to Israel. To disclose the truth. To declare the truth that God is holy and his people had sinned. But what have we said? Those who receive what is revealed will be rescued, redeemed, and restored. Well, Daniel was one of those who received what God revealed. And we're going to look a lot more at the details of his life as we go on in the next few weeks. But we know the big picture of how Daniel responded. He was one of only a small portion of people who would not participate in the detestable things of Babylon. He wouldn't eat food from the king's table when most everyone else would. Later in his life, he wouldn't stop praying when they told him that he had to. And other people kept on praying. Daniel would not. Guess what that makes Daniel? Like reason this out. What does that make Daniel? It makes him a remnant. Isn't that right? A remnant is a small remaining portion of something. He was a small remaining portion of people who were like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. At the beginning of Israel's 70-year captivity, Daniel had the heart of a remnant. The heart of a remnant says, we may face the furnace of fire, but we will never bow down. But think about this. Where did he get that heart? Where did he get that heart? Where did he get that resolve? Like who prepared Daniel for the fire? Who taught him how to partner with God like that? Most likely, his family and his community. Just like us, Daniel grew up in a season of history when the love of many had grown 
cold, a time when people were worshiping idols, a time when people were participating in detestable things that grieved the heart of their God. And notice I said their God. We're talking about people who were doing detestable things while still declaring they were devoted to God. You guys know those two things don't mix, right? You know that that drives God bonkers when we declare that we're about him, but we're hanging on to the detestable things. That's the theological term for that, bonkers. It drives God bonkers. It always has. God says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but this thing in the middle, this lukewarm thing, it makes me just want to spit it out. You got to hear that. To continue, I'm not talking about every now and then I sin or I make a bad decision or, oh, I shouldn't have done that this way. I used to do, but I don't do that anymore, but I did do that. I'm talking about when we are pursuing, loving, choosing detestable things while declaring that we love God and serve him and him alone. God's, it's driving him bonkers. He's like, I can't stand that. Doesn't mean he doesn't love us, but he does not like when we are just sloshing around in lukewarm water. Write that down. Theologically, we call that being bonkers. Daniel was born and raised in the season when people were ignoring the prophets. And they were doing whatever the heck they wanted to do. But he must have been surrounded by people who remembered a different day. And a different way of living. Maybe his mom and his dad or his aunt and his uncles, his cousins. It could have been his, <laughs> his Sunday school teacher. Maybe it was his youth leaders. People who were saying, I know that, that this is the way it is, but that's not the way it should be. We have to live the way it should be. We have to live for God. Daniel had to have grown up around people who had their eyes fixed on the author and perfecter of their faith. And did everything that they could, everything within their ability to make sure that when the day of the Lord came to humble his people, like Jeremiah said he would, God would find a remnant of people who still loved and obeyed him. And that's exactly what Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's what they were. They were a faithful remnant. And think about this. For Daniel to have faced the den of lions and for the three boys to have faced the furnace of fire without fear means that somebody in their life taught them how to fear God and God alone. Isn't that right? So these four Hebrew young men must have been surrounded by people who were committed to and passionate about reaching the remnant I don't know when God is going to push go on his final apocalypse. <laughs> Part of me thinks he already has. <laughs> Anybody with me on that? He may have pushed go. But what a privilege it would be to be alive. To be someone that God might find faithful upon this earth. To be a part of that small portion of people that God will use for a big purpose. Right? Right? To be among the people who will prophesy, dream dreams, have visions. To be a mouthpiece for God when so many won't. To be a faithful remnant who aren't terrified of apocalyptic times, but who understand their role in them. Daniel understood his role. He wasn't just trying to uphold and maintain his religion, you guys. Well, that's why I'm not going to eat. King's table. I'm a Christian. Listen, it wasn't about religion. It was about his God and it was about being a witness. And he was a witness. And we'll learn more about that in the coming weeks. Will the return of Christ be in our lifetime? I don't know. But if not ours, then maybe our kids' lifetime. 
And if not their lifetime, then maybe our grandkids. If that's the case, then I need to be someone who's not just strengthening my own faith, but I'm all about strengthening the faith of the next generation. Like I've got to be committed to reaching the remnant. In other words, I can't just relax in my role as a faithful remnant. I think that's where people have gotten. Well, at least I'm a remnant. (laughs) I'm just, I'm just like hanging on till the end. If I can just get there, I'm a remnant. I know I'm going, I'm going (laughs) with Jesus. We can't just hang out and relax into our role as a faithful remnant. I got to give everything I've got to the next generation. You hear what I'm saying, church? uh, Church? And challenge them to give everything they've got to the generation after them. Every remnant has to reach the remnant. That's just the way it works. Get this. At the beginning of the 70 years of captivity, Daniel was a remnant. Okay, like God used him in a powerful way. He was a small portion during that time that God used for a big purpose. At the beginning, he was a remnant. At the end of that 70-year period of captivity and discipline for Israel, Daniel is someone who was reaching the remnant. Isn't that right? In Daniel 9, towards the end of the 70-year captivity, it says that one day... Daniel was studying the words of the prophet Jeremiah. And he reads something that I'm sure he'd read dozens and dozens of times. It wasn't the first time he's read this. But this time he reads it and God grabs his attention. And this is Jeremiah 29. I believe it's going to be on the screen. So I'll just read it. You can read along with me. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you. To bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore Your fortunes, that makes sense, because that's what we've said this morning. Those who receive what is revealed will be rescued, redeemed, and restored. He says, I will gather you from all the other nations and from the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place from where I sent you into exile. So he's reading this in Jeremiah 29, and he looks up, and he starts doing the math. And it hits him. He realizes this 70 years is almost up. The 70 years is almost up. God is about to fulfill these promises. And so we read in Daniel 9, he says, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. So I gave my attention to the Lord. (laughs) Don't you love that? I gave my attention to God to seek him by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Please read Daniel 9 on your own. Read it on your own. He starts repenting for the sins of the people, the sins that got them into this mess to begin with, but also where the people's hearts were at that time. You guys, 70 years, 70 years in Babylon. 70 years among a people whose philosophy was live for yourself and no one else. That was the Babylonian motto. Kind of sounds familiar. Live for yourself and no one else. Daniel knew that if something didn't happen, unless something changed in the hearts of the people at that time, they were about to go around the mountain again. And so he gave his attention to the Lord, sought God by prayer and supplication, fasting, sackcloth and ashes, which is a very expressive way of crying out to the Lord. 
And I don't know if you're catching this, and I, and I said it earlier, but at the beginning of the 70 years, Daniel was a remnant. At the end of the 70 years, Daniel was reaching the remnant, crying out for this generation to come, crying out for the generation that was going to get to go home and get a fresh start, crying out, repenting on their behalf. And here's what's crazy. Daniel's crying out for the remnant of that season in history. And God begins to reveal things to Daniel about the last season of history. God used Daniel's heart for the remnant to prepare the end times remnant. And that's us. I mean, aren't we studying the book of Daniel right now? Aren't we reading the words that he wrote as he was riled up about being a remnant? Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the next couple of chapters contain some of the most detailed prophecy. He began, God begins to disclose the truth about the last days. All these prophecies, prophecies that paint a picture of what we can look for in our day. I mean, the end times are real, right? Let me, I'm asking you, are the end times a fairy tale? Just this thing that sometimes we, we think it's true, but sometimes we don't think it's true. And we wonder if it's really real because it's been so long. I think it might be. A, is it a fairy tale that Jesus is coming back? Is the apocalypse a fairy tale? It's not. It's not. It's real. The revelation of Jesus Christ, the things which must take place soon. The revelation, the disclosure of truth, the apocalypse. The end of the world, as we know it, will happen. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, Beloved, this is my second letter to you. <laughs> this is my second letter to you. Both of them are reminders to stir you to wholesome thinking. He goes on and he says, God is patient with you. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Like a thief, the heavens will disappear with a roar the elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and its works will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and its works will be laid bare since everything will be destroyed. And he's already said it. And we've read another part of this earlier. He's already said it three times that the earth will be destroyed by fire, that it will be laid bare, that it will be um, there's another place where it says, well, I'm, I'm, I'll keep reading since everything will be destroyed in this way. What kind of people ought you be? If this is what's going to happen, what kind of people ought you be? You ought to conduct yourselves in holiness and godliness as you anticipate and hasten the coming day of the Lord when the heavens will be destroyed by fire. So he says it again. And the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. And I love verse 14. Therefore, beloved, as you anticipate these things, make every effort to be found at peace, spotless and blameless in his sight. Blameless in our time. Noah, blameless in his time. Daniel, blameless in his time. Another appeal that we see in Scripture that we need to be blameless in our time. Here's what I hear Peter saying the best way for you to prepare for the end of the world is to have a personal apocalypse remember what apocalypse means a revealing and uncovering the disclosure of truth Remember, those who receive what is revealed will be rescued, redeemed, and restored. So a few questions that we all have to ask ourselves are, have I personally believed the truth about Jesus? Have I personally received salvation? Like, I, am I truly, like, self-assess here, am I truly a born again believer or do I just have some form of religion that has denied the very power of God? Am I truly a born again Christian? 
on a daily basis, is Jesus the centerpiece of my life? If that has sounded fanatic to you when someone suggests that Jesus ought to be the main thing, you may not be a true believer because the point of our salvation is that we're working it out on a daily basis, walking with him, letting the spirit win when our flesh is crying out for those old sinful ways. That's what it means to be a believer. Are we truly, that's a self-assessing question. Have I personally received salvation? I think there's a lot of people who are going to be in for a rude awakening. Jesus himself said, you will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. He's going to be like, man, I hear what you're saying. And you've been saying, Lord, Lord, for a long time. But you never talk to me. You never worship with other saints. You don't study or even read the word. You don't give in any capacity, much less financially. We don't even have to talk about money. Let's talk about your time and the gifts and talents I gave to you. I hear you saying, Lord, Lord, I hear you. But you're going to have to depart from me because I never knew you. That word knew indicates relationship. You don't have a relationship with me because you're not having a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You're not being led by the Holy Spirit. You're not being comforted by the Holy Spirit. You look to WebMD. You're not being counseled by the Holy Spirit. You're listening to everyone else. You're listening to what the world tells you. You listen to what your ungodly friends tell you. You're not letting the Holy Spirit guide you into more and more and more and more and more truth. The Holy Spirit's trying to, be con trying to convict you of sin, but you haven't listened. You haven't repented. I hear you, bro. You're saying, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I'm sorry, but you have to go because I don't know you. He doesn't celebrate that moment. He doesn't celebrate the people that have to go. But scripture says that God is both merciful. His first inclination towards his creation is mercy. So what scripture tells us that he is seated upon the mercy seat. That he rules and reigns this galaxy, this universe from a throne of grace. That's his first thoughts towards us. But he's also just. Have I personally received salvation? Have I personally resolved in my heart to be led by the Holy Spirit and not by the sinful desires that are in my, in my head and in my heart? Am I someone that's choosing to be blameless in my time? Not perfect. Noah wasn't perfect. Daniel wasn't perfect. But these guys were considered blameless because they pursued God. Another question I think we have to ask ourselves is, am I doing my part to reach the remnant? Like, what am I doing to encourage, equip, and empower the next generation? Parents, I want you to listen to me. You have got to take ownership of the discipleship of your kids. Bring them to church. I love that. You should bring them to church. Why wouldn't you bring them to church? Why should your kids not be in Soma Kids every week where they're having fun learning about Jesus? And I think they even get snacks. Why wouldn't you bring them? Parents of teenagers, why in the world, knowing what you know about what your teenager and teenagers around the world are facing, encouraged to find the best suitable pronoun to describe your gender. Being lured in to weird online relationship with 45-year-old perverted people. I could go through a list of what your teenagers are going through. Why in the world would you not have them at youth group every Wednesday night? Why would you feel like you could afford one Wednesday night to just relax at home? It's just been a long day. 
I get that. But it's going to be a long life. They should be there every time. I was a youth pastor for seven years, hundreds and hundreds of kids over seven years. And I tell you, they need to be there every time. I have two teenagers that are in youth right now. At one point, I had three. One's graduated out. There's times where they don't want to go. They had a long day, stressful day, school, or whatever, and they don't want to go. I'm like, I'm sorry, you're going. Why? Because you're jacked up. You need to go. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just saying. I mean, you need to teach them at home. Because we're just assistant coaches. You know that, right? You're the head coach. You're the head coach, parents. We're just assistant coaches, and we want to help you the best we can. But if you somehow think we're the head coach, and you might be an assistant coach, maybe you just think, I'm not even that. I'm just the water boy. Flip-flop that. You are the head coach, and we want to help you every way that we can. Are you with me? If you're a non-parent, if you're here, and you're a non-parent, which means that maybe you're single, you don't have any kids, or you're married, you don't have kids yet, whatever. Here's what I would encourage you to do. How do I reach the, the, the next generation? Well, clearly you should put on a crusade here in Tyler, Texas. No, that's not what it takes. Like, what if you found some of your friends that have way too many kids? Like, why y'all got six kids? What were y'all thinking? <laughs> Just kidding, I have four. But I do say, what was I thinking? And you know, you can tell they're stressed out. They walk around like this. <laughs> to go up to them and to say, would you guys like a date night? Won't you drop your kids off at my house? Or I'll keep it in your house. Y'all do have plenty of Benadryl in stock, right? <laughs> <laughs> and give them a date night. They hadn't had a date night since they produced their first kid. You can serve somebody that way. Just minimal. Right then, you did something to reach the remnant. Serving in Soma Kids. And this isn't just a shameless plug. This is a... uh, I'm trying to encourage you to be a part of reaching the remnant. Every week. Right before I preach, right after worship, I'll go and use the restroom so that I'm not dancing weird up on the stage while I'm preaching. And I come out of that men's restroom... Right every week, every week. And that's right when the kids are lining up to go out that door. And you guys have seen that line, right? There's a lot of them. And they're going over there. And they're learning about Jesus. And they're having fun. And some of them cry when they have to go because they had so much fun. That's a good sign, saints, when your kids are crying because they don't want to leave. It's a good sign. Unless they don't want to go back to your house, and that's a bad sign. You work that out. <laughs> Serving so my kids. I'm going to sign up. Well, I don't have kids. So? It's not like you got to do it every week. Once every six weeks, maybe? Just get in there. Help. Do something. It doesn't matter if you're single or if you're married and you don't have kids yet. Maybe you're empty nesters or grandparents. Maybe your grandparents. Hey, listen, I want you to think about something. When the 70 years were up and the Israelites came back into the land and people made their way back up to Jerusalem, one of their first efforts, as quickly as they could, they began to reestablish their worship there at the temple. They began to restore, rebuild, restore the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had ransacked and destroyed. In Ezra 3, I want you to listen to this. In Ezra 3, it says, When the builders had laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites with cymbals, they took their position to praise the Lord as King David of Israel had prescribed. And they sang responsively with praise and thanksgiving to the Lord. For he is good, 
for his loving devotion to Israel endures forever. It was probably a rocking song, right? Then all the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord had been laid. But many of the older priests, Levites, and family heads who had seen the first temple wept loudly when they saw the foundation of this temple. Still, many others shouted joyfully. The people could not distinguish the shouts of joy from the sounds of weeping because the people were making so much noise. And the sound was heard from afar. Y'all look up at me. What an amazing act of mercy for the Lord to allow a remnant of people who remembered what life was like before. Before Babylon made its mark on their hearts and their minds and their kids, and their culture. What an act of mercy. You keep reading in Ezra, and even over on into Nehemiah, those who wept, they didn't just weep. They also became a witness to the next generation. They gave the next generation everything they had. Here's what it means to put God's first. Here's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. This is what happens when you disobey. Trust me. <laughs> this is why you don't want to let your love grow cold. They were alive to reach the remnant. Isn't that why we're alive? I mean, I know we're alive to love the Lord and personally maintain our faithful remnant status. But aren't we alive to reach the remnant? To reach the next generation? To make sure that there is a small portion of people that understand that God wants to use them for a big purpose? To reach the next generation of worshipers? You know, the first SMS text message was sent December 3rd, 1992. That's the year I graduated. So I was roughly the same age as Daniel might have been when he experienced his personal apocalypse. I remember life before cell phones and before social media. I know what life was like before. I know how those things and other things have affected our culture. And I have a responsibility to keep my kids grounded and unbranded by the new Babylon. I was thinking about how some people do weep. And, and, and I'll pick on the older generation a little bit. You weep. You weep. Oh, this world stinks. That's how you weep. This world stinks. It's just not like it was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it's like, but you're not a kid anymore. They are the children. They are the ones living in a day that you could never understand. It's like we've given up on this generation. We don't understand them. Therefore, let's leave them alone. No, that's not the type of weeping we need to do. We need to weep because we are hurt by what they are going through. And the condition of their heart. The enemy is coming so hard after them. And we're complaining about life's not like it was when we were kids. Well, our parents were saying the same thing. They won't know what they're missing. I'll say it that way. Unless we not only weep, but we also witness. 
Could you imagine if every 60-year-old decided they wanted to be a mentor to a 16-year-old? What would happen? I'm talking about 60-year-old godly men and women, not weirdos. But what would happen? What would happen if a 60, 70-year-old man or woman was willing to meet with two or three teenagers? Just tell their story. I have a good friend that was telling me a story about they have some land. And I know I'm going along here maybe. They have some land and uh, there's a portion of their land that they just kind of use to throw stuff out there, just stuff they don't use anymore. Anyway, there's this old vehicle that they have on the land. And he was about 14, maybe 15 at the time. And he and his buddies were out playing um, paintball and all the stuff because you can hide behind all the junk that was out there. And uh, one of them had gotten into uh, a vehicle, an old truck that was out there. And they, two of them, were, they were in there and they were hiding. And, and my friend was one of them. And one of the kids was like, dude, what is this? And my friend was like, really? Yeah, what, it, what does it do? And my friend, his name's Sean, he said, you roll down the window. <laughs> He's like, oh, cool, cool. All he'd ever known was the power button. You guys know what I'm talking about? They know how to roll down a window. Listen, I have a 1993 pickup. And I roll those windows down. You know why? Because the air conditioner don't work. (laughs) You guys hear what I'm saying? How many of you remember what a party line is? Raise your hand if you know what a party line is. It's like you never know when someone else is listening on your conversation. A neighbor two or three hundred yards away going, "Mm mm-hmm, I know what you did. Or whatever. I mean, interesting time. What in the, think about the accountability there. I remember many times I was on the phone with my girlfriend and I'd hear somebody clear their throat. Baby, was that you? <laughs> and you'd hear click. <laughs> you know, party line. Party line, bottom line, is when a community of people share the same uh, line. You might have a different phone number, but your, the line was the same. You could hear each other's conversations. It's kind of weird, but there's something beautiful about that. Why don't you stand with me? I just want to challenge you all, just like I did everyone in the service last night. Don't adopt the Babylonian motto. Life's about me. Life's about me. At the end of the day, life's not about us. In life, I can attest that life is most enjoyable when my life is about others. My family, my friends, but also a world around us that has lost its mind. That's when life brings the fullness of joy. When we're walking in the power of the Spirit and obeying the last thing Jesus told us, which is to go and to make disciples. Amen.